in physics, uh, and he's doing some very interesting work, both in kind of traditional uh, biophysics and also in experimental evolution, especially uh, uh, in space, looking at how uh, microbes <laughs> spread out over, over dishes. Thanks a lot, uh. Daniel, for the uh, nice introduction. Um, so you asked me to talk about experimental evolution, and I did some of that um, with um, colonies, and I talk about that in the second part a little bit. But I still don't consider myself as an expert, and perhaps not right now, but later over the course of this uh, lecture, there will be sitting here some experts which actually know much more and. Um, so they should jump in uh, if uh, what I say is actually wrong or if they can provide additional examples um, to what I'm telling. So um, my idea for this lecture is to first give you more or less a broad, relatively broad introduction to experimental evolution, how it works and what we can learn from it. Uh, that will be the first part and I actually don't know how long it takes. It might take longer than 45 minutes. But then we can take the break after that, even if it takes a little bit longer, right? And then in the second part, I'm going to drill in to some, you know, some of the things I um, did myself, which is related to spatial degrees of freedom. So it turns out in the first part, most of the things I'm telling you involve experiments that are well mixed. Um, so where sp space doesn't play a role. And, you know, in physics, we also of often... This is the day of the physics, physicists, so um, I will mention physics a couple of times. In physics, we also often start with um, the assumption of everything being well mixed, globally coupled, and that's a mean field assumption. And but then the question is what happens when you introduce space? And in physics, we know that then um, behaviors can change dramatically. And so I will raise the question whether this can also happen for evolution. But now to start, uh, let me give an overview over the history. This is my history slide. Um, experimental evolution has been around us for a very long time. Humans have been doing this intuitively when they domesticated um, animals, for instance, and selectively bred them um, um, with, uh, with striking results. So for instance, um, the dogs, right, we have now 400 races of dogs which dramatically differ from the ancestor, the wolf, and by selective breeding over just, uh, just 14 to 30,000 years. Um, and humans did this uh, with a number of um, prominent examples, dogs, cats, horses, um, and also with lots of plants like maize, cabbages. Um, so all these were Expo uh, evolution experiments uh, without humans actually knowing what they do is somehow accelerated or experimental evolution and it, it was certainly not done for the purpose of learning anything about experimental evolution it was um, a, a version of biotechnology in a sense um, so what I, mo most, I mostly focus on today are experiments that are actually designed for the purpose of learning something about evolution. And maybe the first one of the first, uh, one of the first experiments of this control type, which is often mentioned, is due to this uh, guy, William Dellinger, Dellinger um, who came up with this incubator in 1880, so not that much longer, that much later than uh, the origin of the species. And uh, so in this incubator, uh, it actually consists of uh, one, two, three containers, and these three containers he <coughs> he uh, cultured unicellular organisms, um, three different kinds, over the course of seven years. And what he did was he controlled the temperature. He first started with a temperature at 16 degrees or 17 degrees Celsius, and then slowly raised it over the seven years to 70 degrees. And he reported the striking finding that the, so first the ancestors with which he started, they could grow very well at 16 degrees, but not at 70 degrees. And at the end of the experiment, he had evolved strains that could do well at 70 degrees, but lost the ability to grow well at these cold temperatures. 
so he already observed um, um, a trade-off. So he first observed an uh, amazingly rapid, well, strong response to selection and uh, trade-offs. So that when you adapt to one environment, you often do worse in others. But um, this experiment had a couple of drawbacks that plagued, I think, many evolution experiments until the 1960s, which is uh, there were no replicates, really. There was just one instance of this evolution experiment. It was reported what was seen. Um, the strains were not frozen, so there's no record of those uh, strains. And actually, accidentally, the whole thing got destroyed at 18... 86, and so no traces are left except for what this guy wrote up. Um, so then in the 1960s, evolution experiments started to become much more controlled, and people started to realize that it's uh, important to um, have um, replicates, big populations, and relatively large times. And still we are now in a phase, in an exciting phase, where um, these experiments go towards automation, where you use robots to uh, handle many, many different replicates, uh, hundreds, thousands, or even microfluidics, where you can go uh, to millions of replicates now. And also other high-throughput me uh, methods that I will mention uh, later. Okay, that's the history, as far as I understand it. Um, then how does experimental evolution work? Um, it works essentially like real evolution, except that there's an experimenter that controls uh, the environment, uh, the, um, the initial condition, and uh, the experimental regime under which evolution happens. So all these experiments are, in a way, versions. Can you see this red dot? Actually, it's very faint, right? Uh, I'll be faint. Um, sorry? It's fine. Um, so this is a literal picture of what is done in, often uh, in a standard microbial evolution experiment. So you grow uh, a particular strain, which you define, a set of strains. In a cult culture here, it's typically well mixed, so no space. Space uh, is not relevant. If you mix, if you shake that, uh, culture very well. You grow it up until stationary phase, for instance, then you dilute it, uh, grow again for a certain time, which you define, dilute it, and so on. And most evolution experiments have flavors of this, growth, dilution, and repetition. Uh, what you have to do is you have to define your initial condition, and there are very, some very popular model organisms, and why they are popular I will mention later on. Also E. coli, uh, budding yeast, uh, worm, C. elegans, fruit fly. And then uh, you can also decide whether you want to start with a single ancestral isogenic um, strain or whether you want to start with some pre-existing standing variation. And that has important differences. Uh, that leads to important differences in the dynamics of adaptation because obviously if you start with just one ancestral genotype, then you have to wait for mutations to come in uh, until something happens. Um, Finally, define the experimental regime. Uh, define how uh, the, the size of the population that you want to evolve, the number of generations for which it should evolve, and the type of selection uh, you, um, you subject, the, subject this population to. So, so in this case, it's merely dilution. So you grow them under certain condition, and then you dilute them. So you're selecting for growing very well under these conditions. But you can think of other types of selection, directional selection. If you breed dogs, then you select for dogs of th certain traits. Um, or I show other examples actually on the next slide. And then, of course, it's crucial to replicate the whole thing to be able to distinguish um, uh, whether what you see is just um, really chance or whether it's actually a typical result that you see. So uh, what are typical outcomes? So I will go now through a couple of examples to make a couple of points that have been observed by experimental evolution. First of all, if you, um, if you take um, 
populations of higher organisms with standing variation and start to adapt them to certain conditions, then you can um, see or observe very strong response to selection. <clears throat> so for instance, in the first case, um, the fruit fly was um, selected for increasing flying speeds in a wind tunnel, essentially. So, uh, so imagine um, lots of flies in this container and then you start flowing air through this uh, tunnel then only the strongest one, the ones that uh, flow fastest, the, that fly fastest, will be able to reach this end of the chamber. And then the experimenter comes in and creams off these, um, these flies and transfers it to the next generation, or selectively breeds those. And it turns out that uh, over the course of 100 generations, you can increase like the top flying speeds from that amount to 1.7 meters per second. So that's a very large increase in these flying speeds. Pretty impressive, I would say. I don't know what the population sizes of the bottlenecks here are, fortunately. I know about this time scale here. Well, then there are funny things done, like here is selection for voluntary wheel running in mice. So um, mice are observed, so they are um, presented with a wheel, um, and it's essentially uh, mice are selected that um, voluntarily enter this wheel and um, essentially what's counted is per day the number of uh, wheel revolutions that uh, a given mi uh, mice carries out and the ones that do the most are selectively bred. And that experiment runs since 98 and now runs for over 65 generations. And the number of voluntary uh, wheel revolutions or, uh, has been increased by a factor of three. Also pretty amazing. And similar results can be observed for endurance running in mice. And there are many other examples of this type. And uh, it's essentially consistent with, I think, what was known before, namely that humans were able to selectively breed, for instance, dogs or crops, uh, and that the response to the selective breeding was very, very fast um, if you have standing variation present. Now, these were the first and, or, no, were, are controlled lab experiments where you can quantify this response to selection. Um, and they are done in the lab. Now, next I would like to mention one of the very few field evolution experiments that have um, actually been carried out. Yes. I know sometimes people say that there's like some uh, uh, universal patterns in how the response to selection slows down over time. You know much about that? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know yeah. much about that. I could imagine that if, you, if the standing variation runs out That's due to the, the idea, selection, that, 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 that then you know, the response might slow down and then you have to wait for input of new mutations. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I it's could imagine thing. this happens, but uh, I don't know. Does anybody know, Monty? Yeah, yeah, could it be that there are physical limits that you cannot go on forever? Oh yeah, that's that, probably for true. For sure, so like... Speed um, of light. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, yeah, so, so um, I, like... There's a, there's a really old uh, corn experiment uh, that's been going on for like a hundred years now, uh, and they've you know, selecting up on protein and oil or down on protein and oil, and basically you know you can't get below zero oil. <laughs> you can get very close to it actually, but yeah, there's a physical limit. But then also, I mean, with some of these, way before you hit any obvious physical limit, it'll slow down, and the the explanation is. People think it's what Oscar says. Monty, you had a comment on that? Well, there's no generalization that sometimes in large populations, response to selection generally continues for a very long time. The mm. plateau that you're thinking of actually is usually a small population effect, an inbreeding effect. Uh, but there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of evidence that new mutations arise that permit continued response in large populations. Mm. Okay. Um, but you don't see a change in the slope of adaptation. Like initially, you select well, only on standing variation. Stochastic, but if there's no consistent pattern. No consistent pattern. There 
have some intrinsic limit. Mm. Generally, if you do bigger experiments, those plateaus uh, disappear or change character. But that's, yeah, that's exactly what what I think you were saying. That like it's just because there's some amount of standing variation in the beginning population given by the number of individuals, and then you start getting rid of that. If you have more individuals, you have more variation to begin with, and you can go for longer. There's also, mutations are coming in more also quickly. Also, more mutations. Yeah. All right. Um, so, but these are lab experiments, and I want to mention that later on I will mention uh, artifacts that come in because we are doing lab experiments and because we are using lab organisms. So actually what is very valuable are, uh, uh, that is, uh, field experiments. But unfortunately they are just very, very few. And so I mention, I think, a classic example now, which is a guppy field experiment. So guppy is a certain type of fish. Uh, and um, this experiment was done by John Endler, um, started in, I think, uh, 78. And uh, he, before he started this experiment, he had realized that the male um, part of the species has varying numbers of spots. Um, like here, these blue spots, very hard to see, but these are colorations, essentially, to, I guess, be attractive. Uh, but he realized that uh, the number of spots that you can observe on these male uh, individuals depends on the type of predators that are around. Um, so in the rivers he has been looking at, there were two types of predators. Uh, on the one hand, cichlid uh, fish, which are really ravenous uh, predators of these fish. Um, and the other spe predator species is called rivulus. And, uh, but this species only eats juveniles, which don't have these spots yet. And he realized that in uh, rivers, without any predators or with this predator present, the number of spots was much higher than when in the river there were cichlids around. Okay, so he had the hypothesis that these predators uh, select, essentially for the presence of these predators, selects for uh, guppies of a certain number of spots. And he wanted to test this in actually both a, sort of a kind of lab experiment, which is the first one I described, and a field experiment. So in the first one, he collected um, guppies from 18 locations and several rivers. And he brought them to 10 different ponds, greenhouse ponds that he had uh, at home. And he grew them jointly in the absence of any predators for a couple of months. I think here you see it for nine months. And recorded um, the number of spots that you see. That's the initial line here. So here it's plotted the number of spots per fish as a function of time. And this number was increasing in this first period, okay, where they were grown jointly. And then the real experiment starts, where the ponds were subdivided, these 10 ponds. They had then, um, he defined four ponds where he added Rivulus, this relatively harmless um, predator, four ponds where he added cichlids, and two ponds which were just control ponds. And then he observed the number of spots over time further. And he observed <coughs> what he <coughs> hypothesized, namely that uh, in the control ponds and in the rivulus ponds, the number of spots further increased in the ponds with the cichlids it went down. And that was a lab experiment controlled. There were even some replicates uh, that he has done, uh, quite laborious. But he even rep replicated this experiment then in the field. So um, in the Aripo River in Trinidad, um, he looked around and he found in um, some side streams of that river, he found streams that, it's hard to see here, unfortunately, that um, contained um, guppy with, in the presence of Rivulus, this harmless predator, guppy in the, within the presence of uh, cichlids uh, with relatively few spots, and guppies without any uh, predators around as well. And he found um, a pond that contained uh, cichlids, but no guppies yet. Okay. And what he did was he transferred uh, guppies from the river 
that contained only rivulets, where the, um, no, I'm sorry. What he effectively did, so the key experiment was to take guppies from a river that contained these ravenous predators where the spot size was small, and he transferred those to um, a stream that contained this relatively harmless predator. And he came back two years later and observed that the number, that the spot size increased. Um, so I mentioned this whole experiment because it's really one of the few. We have a real field evolution experiment. You start with a, a controlled lab evolution experiment uh, and you obtain a result. But often then you don't know whether it translates to real life, to nature. And he went into the field and, um, and verified his hypothesis with this kind of experiment. Uh, I don't know of any other what experiments. This is months. What is um, it wasn't mentioned in my source. Uh, they said a couple of generations of fish uh, are, a couple of generations of fish uh, elapse over the period of um, this time. I don't know how many, unfortunately. Or the order 10, I guess. Yes? Oh, doesn't the work of the grants, uh, the biologists from Princeton, uh, two decades of observations on uh, Daphne Major on the beaks of the finch? Doesn't that count as a field experiment? So what did he do in the field? Oh, they, they observed uh, for two decades uh, the sizes of the, of the uh, beaks of finches as uh, weather patterns were changing. And, uh, uh, and they saw uh, natural selection because of the changing sizes of the seeds available. Mm. And, uh, and, and the pendulum went back and forth as as weather went from uh, dry to wet and back to dry. Right, but did he modify the no, field? No, So then it, then it doesn't count as an experiment. It's okay. just observing what's happening in nature. That's not enough. You have to do a real experiment. So that's <laughs> regarded as the grand area of all, I mean, uh, uh, observations of evolution uh, as we see it. Okay, that's, that's really one way of learning about evolution, just watching in the wild and collecting data and trying to interpret in terms of evolution. But the other one is really to do an experiment. That's a research tool, essentially. And here, I mean, this kind of, these kinds of experiments, of course, raise ecological um, concerns and ethical concerns. Can you do that? Just take some species here and bring it to Australia. Probably many species that you bring to Australia would suddenly proliferate a lot but um, cause many problems. So much going on there as it is. Sorry? They didn't, they didn't have to do any of these transfers. Yeah, it's fine. I'm not saying that this is not strong evidence for, uh, for, uh, for um, the hypothesis that he had. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying it's not an evolution experiment. Okay. I'm talking about evolution experiment. That's only the topic. I was supposed to talk about <laughs> That's why I'm doing this. What's the connection between the number of spots and the connection is the more spots you have, the more shiny you are, and the more easily you are identified by the predator. That was the hypothesis. Sorry, I should have started with that. But, I mean, it, it seems that the, 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 the more uh, the harmless predator, uh, yeah. you know, your spots increase in the There has been an acceleration of the increase. Compared to the control? Yeah, there are no arrow bars here. He had replicates, but in this plot, uh, unfortunately, you cannot see the variation between the replicates. But I guess it's not significant. Um, now back to lab experiments. Um, so what we've seen before were experiments that modified, uh, in a way, quantitative characters, number of spots, um, um, flying speeds in flies, um, things that you can quantify and really just want a certain number to increase over time through evolution. But a whole other subject is whether you can <coughs> evolve real novelty, key uh, innovations, let's say. Can you evolve, for instance, multicellularity? Or can you evolve speciation? And many things have been attempted. Typically what's reported are those that are successful. Um, so I'm showing you how to evolve multicellularity in, for instance, yeast. But let me just mention there are also, for instance, speciation that has been tried. 
uh, apparently a number of times, but there were no very successful, as well, my source told me that there are no uh, successful evolution experiments so far that could uh, evolve speciation. Where did uh, they meet? Do you know what they, hmm? with, they met like with obligate sexuals? Or? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Um, but here now, um, evolution of multicellularity. So this is a relatively recent experiment involving budding yeast, <coughs> which has been evolved uh, where 10 lines, replicate lines, were evolved for 60 rounds of selection. And the type of selection was special. So these um, yeasts were grown in test tubes, like it is done normally. But then, um, after they are grown to saturation, they are allowed to stand on the bench for on the order of an hour. And then, over this course of time, um, the yeast cells are due to gravity settling down. Um, but when they clump, when they cluster together, they are settling down faster. Okay, and so the selection that was uh, applied here was to take, to transfer to new medium only those cells that are present in the lower part of these test tubes uh, for 60 rounds. And what they found is the evolution of these snowflake um, yeasts. Um, and they are uh, obviously clusters of yeast cells, but they stick together not just by sticking, but they don't separate after division. That's, that's sort of the uh, feature that evolved here. And they further evolved these snowflakes over time and could uh, observe the evolution of a couple of other life history traits, like that um, the reproduction of these clusters eventually uh, was carried out through propagules, which were still multicellular, almost not like germ cells, because they were still multicellular. But it started to really look like uh, multicellular, or like uh, aspects of multicellularity. Uh, there were some you know, comments that, OK, with the yeast, that's perhaps not such a big surprise, because uh, yeast has seen multicellularity. But uh, now they repeated the, essentially the same experiment with Chlamydomonas, a green algae, uh, which uh, presumably has not seen multicellularity before. And they could also observe um, the evolution of clusters, which then, in this case, actually reproduced by uh, unicellular propagules, which I guess are these guys. And they are phenotypically similar to the unicellular ones they started with. They argue that the evolution of these propagules uh, really is not driven by um, um, you know, Having unicellular propagules, um, it's often argued that this is beneficial to avoid conflict between cells, right? Um, but they argue here that evolution of these unicellular propagules evolved as a more, uh, for a different reason, because it simply increases the growth rate of these clusters if you have these unicellular propagules around. And as a side effect, you also um, reduce um, the conflicts between these cells. All right, so um, that was a success story as well. And there are many other things that people Wait, have evolved. Yes. Uh, so are you gonna, you're not going to talk about evolving diversity or? Uh, evolving diversity? You, you mentioned evolving species, and you're, okay, in, in obligate sexuals, okay, that's tough, they're hard to work with. Big, mm -hmm. um, but then, like, with, with microbes, there have been experiments where they've successfully evolved, like, diverse morphologies. I think that's kind of it. I will not talk oh, okay. about this so much. Right. If you want, you can comment on this. Um, yeah, well, just may, maybe, maybe it's, it's it just to avoid giving people the wrong impression. Um, so so specia speciation and diversification are not exactly the same thing. Speciation may be hard for technical reasons with obligate sexuals, but diversification in experimental evolution is pretty easy. Uh, oh, that's like true. You, you can. Uh, a reference there would be like uh, Paul Rainey. Right. Um, or Roberto, Roberto Coulter. Um, yeah. yeah. Experiment. Um, diversification after you spatially separate them or just diversification of the well-mixed population? Uh, well, in these cases, you don't actively spatially separate them. You just don't actively stir them. I see. And then naturally, they, they do it on their own. Um, then even when you actively stir them, so like uh, the 
Rich Lenski experiment, which I guess you, you're, you're, you're building up to. Uh, I don't want to spoil it if you're, if you're going to talk about the diversity there, but probably not. not. so much. Okay, so then there, um, even in these experiments where they actively stir them, they still see like uh, 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 genetic diversity persisting over long periods of time, longer than it would plausibly be if it was just purely neutral. So that suggests that there is some kind of diversification uh, going on, even if it's tough to see when you're mixing them all together. All right. Um, awesome. Yes. I just to ask you, so when you say that the multicellularity evolved, was it was multicellularity inherited in, in the sense that yes. did generation after generation yes. form multicellular That's right. phenotypes? Yes. So this the phenotype is simply uh, growing these clusters, and eventually these clusters reproduce by sending out these propagules, and they go somewhere else and grow again clusters. Yes? What I was wondering with these experiments is, uh, so it seems like the selection pressures are kind of artificial. Yes, directed. Yeah. It's, it's set by the experimenter. Yeah. But um, sort of here the problem was, you know, can we do this? Right. For, for yeah, so I'm giving, I'm giving you a spectrum of, of evolution experiments. So, yeah. so this one maybe belongs to the class of directed selection evolution experiments, where, um, and like the fly experiment, you go in and select um, a spe particular trait. Um, you know, naturally, that doesn't happen. Right. Um, but, you know, then there are, I will tell you, I will talk a lot about one particular microbial evolution experiment where the type of selection is more natural of that kind, simply okay. diluting them, diluting the population, and the ones that grow faster get selected. Even with this one, I, I don't think we, it's too artificial. I mean, remember, it's not that they select for multicellularity, it's selected like for right. sinking, right? There's, that's a pretty natural thing to select for. There's lots of cases where, like, the top of some liquid is getting washed away or skimmed off, and only the things that settle to the bottom get to stay. Okay, so it's 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 kind of believed that this would be one mechanism by which. No, they even write in the paper that what they do is not because they think their t their type of selection is is quite natural and o has occurred. Yeah. They only do it because they can do it very well in the lab. It's very easy to do, <coughs> and it shows this phenotype. So the, I think the surprise the price of these papers, and there's another one which. Um, done it a little bit differently, um, was that you can do it. And you can do lots of other things um, by watching evolution uh, in action. And with this, let me just, uh, oh yeah, let me go essentially to, to another important aspect, what important thing that you can learn with evolution experiments, you can test hypotheses. Um, and um, Theoretical papers about evolution have generated numerous hypotheses um, that um, are also partially contradicting each other. So you would like to carry out evolution experiments to either verify or falsify these um, hypotheses. And in this paper here, they have a very, very long list of those hypotheses and ways how they were tested, and the organism here in the reference. So I invite you to look at those. Um, but let me mention, for instance, let's go there and um, sex and recombination accelerate adaptation to a novel environment. And that has been um, tested in various organisms. And um, you know, with many of these hypotheses, um, the question is just you have to look long enough and in um, different systems and eventually you'll find it. So the real question is whether the hypothesis that you're formulating is like typically true uh, and important in many systems or a really rare exception. And that gets you into quantitative questions. And I will argue that really some of the most interesting questions in experimental evolution are really quantitative. And um, I think we are entering an exciting stage of getting more of 
you know, evolving or you know, pushing this instrument further to make more quantitative statements rather than just um, watching evolution happen one instance and then um, and then that's it because it could be just rare the question is you know if you ask yourself can I evolve something then um, I guess typically the answer is yes if you just wait long enough then you will be able to do it but the real question is how long do you have to wait so it's often it brings you to a question of time scales and, um, and how likely it is to evolve and these are quantitative questions which are really the most as far as I'm concerned uh, the most exciting ones um, so let me maybe summarize the um, um, areas of application of experimental evolution so on the one hand it's biotechnology so um, selective breeding is what humans have done for a long time as a way as a version of biotechnology uh, then vaccines are routinely, routinely <coughs> or have been routinely generated by um, evolving pathogens in either in media or in some hosts different from hum humans in order to make them less virulent until you can use them as live attenuated vaccines and with this experimental evolution has saved you know, millions of lives uh, so it was very important in this uh, aspect and still is then it's been used to test hypothesis, as I mentioned. Um, it's been used as um, developing, as proof of principle experiments. Can we involve multicellularity? Yes, we can. In a re and with speciation, you know, it hasn't been, we haven't been able to do this so well. Um, but as I argued just now, the real important question I think are quantitative. What you're really asking is, can we evolve multicellularity in a reasonable time frame in what we can do in an uh, experimental evolution experiment? And with multicellularity, we can do this. With speciation, not so far not. Um, so that brings me to um, this um, question of how can we quantify evolution using these experiments? Uh, how can we quantify rates and types of evolutionary scenarios? And if you're interested in those quantitative questions, that brings you naturally to um, microbes and evolution of microbes, which is what I focus actually on in the rest of my talk. Um, before I mention that, before I mention the microbes, first time, let me uh, summarize a couple of quantitative questions that can be addressed in microbial evolution. You can ask how fast do populations adapt? Obviously, how fast is um, change, the evolutionary change of these populations. What are the key parameters that control this evolutionary dynamics? How many routes are there towards adaptation? Uh, how, you know, is that, is that just one route? And if you have replicates, you always go this route if you adapt, or are there many different routes? Um, what are the consequences and mechanism of adaptation? Is do you just increase fitness? Or are there other traits that evolve? What is the rate of spectrum of beneficial mutations? How do mutations interact? Is there uh, epistasis and is it um, very strong? And can we quantify that? And these are just one of some of the uh, quantitative questions you can ask. And in order to answer these questions, it's really natural to focus on microbes. And the reason is that microbes have a very fast, um, uh, very small generation time. So an E. coli is just 20 minutes. In, under, under good conditions, in yeast it's 90 minutes, then by definition microbes are small in size, which means that can cultivate very large populations. And the larger the population, the larger the influx of mutations of some kind, so the larger uh, expected rate of evolution. There's often excellent genetics, particular for model organisms. Um, you can use genome-based tools to find mutations, you have even microbes, um, often forms of multicellularity. We may just yeah. when you say excellent genetics, what do you, maybe people don't know what you mean by that. Um, tools of genetics. So if you want to, if you observe an adaptation, you want to know, okay, what specific mutation is it that gave rise to this phenotypic change? And 
Yeah, there are lo lots of. Or, or, yeah, or if you want to like manipulate the genetics. Oh, yeah, that is also if something. If you want to, you know, put in something to make it easier to work with, you can do that. Right. If you have an hypothesis that certain mutation is responsible for a certain adaptation, then you can put in this mutation into the ancestor and to verify that. Verify that. Um, the ancestors can be frozen down, and on, you know, during the course of the evolution experiment, you can freeze down the derived strains, um, and that allows you to uh, reconstruct the path of evolution. You can replay evolution by starting from ancestors at a, for a certain state, and you can do many, many replicates. So these are all advantages. There are also disadvantages with, uh, of doing evolution experiments with lab strains in particular, which I'll mention later. And microbial evolution experiments typically look uh, like this. In this review, there are three different types um, highlighted. So on the one hand, uh, we have an evolution experiment where really adaptation is almost prevented from happening. Um, this, these are mutation accumulation experiments. So you start with a microbial culture on a petri dish. You streak out these microbes. And then you streak them. When you, when you do this thoroughly, then you find single colonies which have derived from single cells. Now, these co after a short period of time of growth, you then take uh, the single colony, streak it out on a new uh, plate to again um, look for colonies that have derived from a single cell. Uh, and by this um, procedure, you are introducing very, very strong bottlenecks in the course of this evolution experiment. So that's plotted here. The population size, you start essentially, after each transfer, you start with just one cell, grow uh, the population, and then choose, again, a very, very strong bottleneck. And um, there's still selection happening, uh, which means um, if mutations come in that have an impact on, uh, on the growth rate, they will, you know, then selection will act in these periods of growth. But if this time delta t is relatively small, then it is typically assumed that in this experiment, what you see, the evolution changes you see, simply reflect the spectrum of mutations that are coming in. So these experiments are carried out to, to, to understand the spectrum of mutations. Um, really, if you want to see adaptation, then, um, you have two generic types of carrying out your evolution experiment. One is a continuous culture. This is a chemostat where um, medium is added in at a constant rate and at the same rate culture is taken out so that the population size um, fluctuates around a steady state. And that's a continuous culture. And the alternative to that is a serial transfer experiment, uh, which I mentioned before. You start. Um, adding microbes to fresh medium, let them grow, and then dilute, let them grow, dilute, and so on. Um, so there are lots of technical problems with these uh, continuous cultures uh, to, for instance, avoid contamination, so that this is considered a very robust way. It's a bit unfortunate that you always have these bottlenecks, and um, you always typically, because delta T is typically one day, you can hardly avoid that... Uh, to enter stationary state. So you cannot, it's hard with this to maintain a continuously exponentially growing population. And uh, actually, it might, might be a good place for a break to let people For a break? Yes. Yes. All right, yeah, that's good. Uh, but, but yeah, so maybe if there's any, uh, any questions just on the basics. Yes? I'll just make one observation. So experimental studies in evolution are are a good analogy for it, uh, evolution in natural populations up to a point. But in natural populations, species have options that are not available in the laboratory. That is, they can migrate or they can go extinct. Mm. In the laboratory, they have no choice but to respond to the selection of pressures that are imposed. And so I think it's worth bearing that in mind. Yeah, I think that's one of the artifacts that you might be looking at when you look at laboratory selection. So, so that in a couple of slides, I mentioned uh, 
you know, issues that come up with uh, lab experiments, especially can you translate these results to uh, <coughs> natural populations for the reasons that you mentioned. That's one of the reasons you mentioned. Guys, let's take a really uh, short break, be back here at 10, and thank Oscar for the first time.